let's jump in. Um, all right, let me do a little screen share. I do not have my home situation, so I might be a little clumsy, but <laughs> all right. Can you see this action? Yes, sir. All right, excellent. So, uh, new new mojo, monthly issue, four parts. We're, we're digging into an operating concept today. It was interesting because, and I guess you could argue, I mean, operating concepts traditionally are, are more aligned with like SaaS operator, right? Where it's like, hey, here's a way to think about modeling churn. Here's a way to think about modeling growth loops, or here's a framework for messaging, you know, whatever. Uh, but I came across this and it's just so good that I had to pull it in. Um, because we're advocates of building in public, of doing anything in public, honestly, I think that's the way to go. And uh, so I guess this is an operating concept that's more from the perspective of a fund operator or a GP as it's often called, or someone who is perhaps doing, I don't know, whoever's writing it, investment memos, <laughs> which is like, <laughs> we like this business, we want to invest in it, whether we go in and operate the business or uh, which would be more of our model to take ownership, majority uh, buyouts, or on the venture side, it's like, hey, we like everything about it, we're going to give them some cash and sit back and see how it goes. Um, so BVP has a collection of investment memos, um, which are totally public. And obviously they've had some straight club bangers, but I, I thought, and uh, we go into the applications here, but I thought for today, um, we would just spend some time maybe going through one and just looking at the components of their memos. There's a little bit of variance, but they're typically pretty structured. Like, what do they even talk about? Uh, why do we think even the sequence? I mean, you think a document is like this, so much time and energy goes into it. And this is the most concise distilled down version that everything is thought through, even the sequence of the items, right? It's like, hey, what contents are we gonna include? How do we sequence them? And then if you're the author, there's probably a little bit of persuasive psychology in there, you know? It's like, we want this thing to crescendo at the end. So people are like, yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> let's invest, wrong. And they did amazing. Cause I read it through and I was like, you know, I probably would have wanted to start here. But then when I read it back a second time for the uh, mind body, I was like, huh, the sequencing makes sense. And it perfectly waterfalls into the, a lovely appendix summary at the bottom. It's like, just perfect. It's like, boom, right? And so obviously, and I guess in terms of investment life cycle, this is typically a, on the buyout side, and we'll just keep it relevant to that, uh, venture is a little bit of a different game. And, and they share a little bit of the story anecdotally of like, hey, we've been in touch with these founders since their series A or since their seed round, and they went with XYZ, and we tried to get in the, on the cap table, but it wasn't, the timing wasn't right, you know, et cetera. So a little bit of that narrative right. comes through. But for the most vast majority, it's like, hey, you make some type of interaction with the founder, or in our case, often it's the seller, and um, they have intent to sell or maybe not. But it's like, hey, you know, how's business? You, you start to kind of uh, identify the, the elements of the business that are attractive or not. For us, we have a pretty structured, pretty consistent objective scorecard. If you like what you see with what is considered mostly public information, maybe you sign an NDA and you start to get under the hood. Then you send an LOI, which is like, hey, I have intent. This is non-binding. I have intent to buy the business at this value or the, it's an indication of value, as they say, and then under these terms. So it's like, hey, million bucks, all cash. Cool, cool. And I want 60 days to really look under the hood and you can't date anybody else. So there's exclusivity, right? Okay, cool. And then you move into diligence and then you probably put together uh, what is a way more thorough kind of due diligence um, findings, right? Which is very robust. And it's like, hey, and then you'll have an investment committee for a lot of folks or you'll pull in kind of your tribe. And it's like, here's the good, the great, the bad, everything that I've got. Ideally, it's structured in a format that you can compare it to other deals because everything is relative, especially in private equity. And then, uh, and then the investment memo is kind of the last like deliverable, right? It's the most condensed. It's for the most senior, most OG folks that are like, my time is at a huge premium. You better hit me with the most important information and nothing more. And I need yep. to be very clear on what the call to action is, what the ask is, et cetera. And we move. So this is kind of the tail end um, of the investment life cycle, if you, if uh, so to speak. So anyway, if we jump in and obviously I was just looking at some of these, um, but if we go... I mean, BVP top quartile, they're on Sand Hill Road, uh, like total, you know, quintessential venture shop. And they've, I mean, their portfolio is insane, but um, the, I guess the public uh, investment memos that they've disclosed, some straight up club bangers here, Shopify, Pinterest, Twilio, Twitch, across B2C um, and B2B. So there's kind of a, a broad spectrum. I think they're pretty, they're identified probably as pretty opportunistic, um, obviously LinkedIn. 
and Toast, which was one that I had kind of a front row seat to playing in HCM um, out in New York. And Mind Body was another one. So I thought we'd look at Toast because that was that was kind of an interesting story. And I think they've it was a interesting trajectory that I think speaks to a lot of the things that we emphasize traditionally in Deer Teardowns. Um, so let's start at the tippity top. So Toast, HCM play. I guess, how would you, like, when you hear Toast, what stands out in your mind, Kev? <laughs> so I'm going to pretend as though I've never heard of this company. The first mm. time I heard the name, <clears throat> it was yeah. kind of like that uh, that Slice company, the one that's where you can just look up local pizza shops, right? Oh, yeah, 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 yeah. So that's what I thought of. I thought it was like maybe a platform for finding local bakeries. Um, maybe it. you can get something catered, delivered, something like that. And actually, when I dove into it, I'm like, huh, it's more on the the the, the human capital side. Um, so yeah, that was my uh, initial thought. Cool. Well, I guess when did, or for me, first time I saw Toast was on a point of sale at a restaurant. And this <laughs> is when, um, oh gosh, the name is escaping me. It was David Olk and his whole crew. It was like Shopkeep, maybe. But there was, I guess, a, a, a scramble. Uh, in the point of sale market, because you had like the OG um, unencumbered uh, NCR was one. Mm -hmm. um, I'm trying to think of the other point of sales, but it was kind of like this legacy hardware that was attached to very legacy enterprise software that these restaurants were supposed to kind of wrangle. And it was totally catered for big multi-unit franchises or big corporate restaurants. And so Shopkeep came in and everyone was like, all right, let's, let's start with point of sale because that is kind of the big pain point. That's our path of entry. And then most of the, the clever ones kind of emerged from there into, and it's like, and if you think about it in, in a hospitality context, where do, where do people, you ever work at a restaurant or bartender or anything? Chuck and cheese, baby. <laughs> yeah, no shit. <laughs> Well, where'd you clock in? Where'd you clock in? High, high school, uh, Atlantic Terminal, downtown Brooklyn. <laughs> okay. Did, but did you clock in at the point of sale? Yeah, yeah, yeah. It was um, this old system. I can't even, I want to say it was either ran by um, ADP or Paychex. It was one of okay. those old, super old school solutions. And they had the physical clock on the wall. And um, uh, depending on the role you were in, you either had a physical punch card or there was a digital system. So if you were more like blue collar, so let's say you fixed the games and the machines, you had a punch card. If you're right. more front desk ticketing for the um, the toys, whatever, you were more digital. So yeah, it cool. was it was interesting. <laughs> well, they're like, oh my goodness! It turns out that the point of sale is like the hub in a quick service restaurant. And it's like employees clock in there, they check their schedule there, they swap shifts there. Um, they get, they look at their pay stubs, they print their pay stubs. So Toast went super hard at point of sale. Um, and this was like, I, and, and they would kind of, I, I guess they would claim that this was also like a shift to cloud too. So let's yeah. see, yeah. And I can uh, clarify, when I first heard of the name, the reason why I thought they were similar to Slice is because I was at Namely, HR Tech. So when they first came up, we saw, um, okay, potentially they might have a challenge in the human capital side because POS systems, they were starting to expand more into these platforms. Like if you think about Namely, Namely just started as benefits and then it yeah. expanded into a platform for payroll, timekeeping, all of those things. So once we got into timekeeping, it was toast. But Toast yeah. also had the ability to manage all of your employees, their schedules, a lot more than just point of sale for inventory. So we started coming up against it and then we went with T-Sheets as the partner. Right. I remember that. Well, and this speaks a lot to um, selling restaurant point of sale and they go into their segment more. But if you think about like HCM's the headline, right? We want to go after something vertical. Every business right. under the sun for the most part has employees. Toast went hard at restaurants. And so for them, it was like, all right, this is high turnover, mostly hourly employees. The point of sale is, is the kind of the linchpin. Whereas if you think about it, namely went hard after software companies, venture back right. companies, and what's the, the big piece there? Benefits. Exactly. Right? How are we going to attract, we need to pitch total, you know, compensation statements. There's, you know, stock options. There's mm -hmm. all, you know, and it got weird there for a while. It's like there's dog walking and there's haircuts <laughs> and all kinds of shit. And yeah, like, hey, it was more like hard trying to find the best market to, to pivot into with the best partners. And if not that, then let's see if we can white label and just offer it ourselves and it was, it was a whole lot of like guessing going on. <laughs> totally. But okay. So let's just zoom out real quick. So we've got, and actually some of them have table of contents. Let me grab 
because you can actually see, let's peep it. Okay, so here they've got summary, market size, potential, product overview, unit economics, financial performance, competitive landscape, risk, team, deal, scenario analysis, and conclusion, right? And so Toast follows a generally similar one. So let's just kind of graze over it real quick and get mm -hmm. a sense. But obviously, this is the exact summary here. So this is metrics driven and it's like, hey, you, if you're just kind of living, you want the quantitative first right between the eyes, cool. And then we'll dig into kind of the voiceover, so to speak, but by the numbers, they go into products and here you start to see all the, the, the jargon. So QSR, right? We want to get quick service restaurants, full service restaurants. Obviously they're catered highly to hospitality to the extent where they've even kind of segmented it down within hospitality. Mm -hmm. um, so we got product and then it goes into the market which is probably pretty short and sweet competition, very short, sweet, right? So they're just thinking about momentum. Um, and then they go into go to market. And this was kind of interesting too, because we can talk about the pivot towards embedded FinTech because mm -hmm. for Toast, they were a SaaS business and then they started to offer merchant services. And now all of a sudden they're making a point on all the money that moves through their point of sale. And then they can open up lines of credit and oh boy, now we've got a very dynamic pricing uh, situation here and that's fun. Um, financials, they go into that, yada, yada, but obviously this is all like textbook, um, venture. So it's like, we're burning a shitload of money, but we're growing like crazy. And then they get into the deal terms. And I thought this was kind of cool too, that they lay out what their kind of general scenarios are. So we think a lot about scenarios where it's either kind of a wipeout, um, base case, we can grow it and we can't fix something else, or we can grow it and we can optimize churn. We usually think about, you know, uh, performance on a, a spectrum of maybe two or three variables, which are growth and, re and retention. Uh, and those are measured as a function of comparables. So it's like, hey, if we can grow middle of the pack, we'll uh, kind of land here. If we can grow top of the pack and retain users middle of the pack, we'll kind of get here. Because mm -hmm. um, again, you want to think obviously in base rates and comps, then they go into team and then they go into key risks. And then there's a summary. So Pretty thorough, but very concise. I mean, we're, we're talking about what, 16 million, I think. Um, so let's let's kind of just skim through it. We've got about 12 minutes here and maybe just call out the things that stand out. Um, but figure, okay, so they're paying a 12X on um, a 17X on ARR, but I guess they this is how they're recognizing revenue is a little bit interesting. Um, and that's a 3.8X on forecasted ARR. Okay. And this was in 2015. <laughs> so at this point, right, it was like an eight to 12 X on forward 12 months, ARR, not even bookings, right. Was very common um, and are not very common, but in the mix. Right. And then obviously you get into like the super froth time, but this was like eight to 12. And then, I mean, you look at some of the headline numbers here, 0.3% gross churn. That's outstanding. Um, they did 800 K in new ARR in November, so they're pacing for 300% year over year growth and they're at kind of that 24 million, uh, like, you know, call it sub 50 million. So it's like, all right, usually it's a, it's a one to five. Holy shit. We got the 5 million, five to 10 million. Oh my God, we got the 10 million and then 10 to 50 and then 50 is the real breakout. So they're kind of catching that mid 10 to 50 tranche and then really healthy growth margins. Uh, they talk a little bit about tack payback here and, and how, I mean, eight month for cat. And the thing too is on the implementations here, you know, it depends on, on how penetrated they were, but they're selling for the most part to SMB restaurants, right? So call it 10, I don't know, I guess you could call it like mid market major account type scenarios, but it's like install the hardware, the hardware, and this is a hardware plus a software play, right? Which is interesting. So they've got to carry inventory for point of sale screens. They've got to do a lot of stuff. There's some complexity there, uh, but it seems like, eight month CAC uh, is, is, is juicy. Like there's probably a lot that they can do to get that CAC down um, outside of that. And then you, I mean, you start to see the real genius, right? And this is, I'm surprised they have this like kind of nestled in here, but when they started to <laughs> expand into merchant services and the credit lines um, and just obviously they have kind of like the ancillary SaaS components, but they use the point of sale as like the just land baby and then they expanded uh because that's you know on average 50 percent expansion yeah. or you know 50 percent expansion beyond what were kind of new logos is how you build a very very rapid growth thing um cool. i would have put the the gross quarterly churn and the net retention points higher up because this is nuts 
Yeah, yes, for sure. And I wonder if there's a little bit of a sequence here because it's kind of like, here's the multiple yeah. we're paying. And then it's basically mm -hmm. like rationalize the multiple. <laughs> right? Exactly. <laughs> right. And it's like, all right, it's like, ooh, like a 12X. And it's like, well, you know, this is this is kind of tiger by the tail situation, right? Um cool. So I mean, nothing really jumped out to me. I mean, I think it was very obvious. Oh, yeah. So here we go. So the OG on-prem proprietary hardware incumbents were Micros and NCR, who make up 50% of the market. Um, and a lot of that was on-prem. Um, that was just on an, you know, kind of undisrupted, unattacked market, right? And so typically you're like, oh man, and I guess it depends on which side of the coin, but right. But it's like, if there's competitive concentration like that, it usually means if this group sneezes, they're going to you know, knock off a bunch of the little long tail players like micro SaaS players. So that the bad side of the coin is like, oh, okay, like if you, hey, we're going to go play in the, we're going to go play in ads. And it's like, okay, it's Google and Facebook. <laughs> it's like, <laughs> basically, <laughs> all right, that doesn't sound fun. Like ad tech, those two pretty, you know, they've stayed with it. They have, you know, big R&D budgets and you can dig into that and try to find like a metric to decide how relevant they've man managed to keep the business over the years. But micros and NCR, it's like, all right, you know, I don't even know them. You know, like whatever. So on the other side of the coin, right, is like, ooh, you're licking your chops. Like two incumbents own 50% of the market and they've grown fat and happy. Let's go get them. Um, what's interesting though is, and I, I think we could look at the competitive set. So yeah, oh, and the, the other thing too, um, that there was a bit here about some strategic decisions that are on the product side, but a lot of the competitors were like, hey, from a hardware perspective, let's go, let's play towards iPads, like hardware that's more standardized or white labelable instead of building proprietary hardware. Cause that was the other convention too. It's like NCR micros were like, we're going to build this weird ass, like checkout thing. That's part cash register, but not, and no one knows how to maintenance it. And if it breaks, we have to order another one from, you know, China and it's going to take six months. These, most of these crews were like, yo, everybody's got an iPad. Let's just build a little stand that goes on top of the cash register. <laughs> Yeah, no, I think I think it's brilliant because from this, you can see a lot of the POS solutions today, they're all either on Android tablets or iPads. Uh, one of the restaurants I work with in Brooklyn, I kind of just advised them on the side. I got them set up with this system called Revy. And yeah. the brilliance in Revy, it's it's exactly like Toast, but it takes it a step further where they not they like they finance all the equipment for you. So they make it part of your monthly subscription, whether you need a printer, a tablet, whatever, it's all part of your monthly subscription. And then they took the idea of Uber, seamless apps like that, and started creating a community of their users so they can discover your restaurant and order if they're within the vicinity. And then there's the alerts and the perks and it it took it to a whole other level. So like, it, it makes sense the way that they decided to make things flexible because the world was already changing where in hospitality, you're constantly moving. <laughs> and yeah. then costs are, costs are high, margins are low. So you got to figure out a way to, to uh, flex out that bottom line with your, your costs. I love it. Yep, no doubt, spot on. And so I think the only other piece here is like, all right, so they went with Android for a more open architecture. Um, and then obviously they start to talk about the transaction process and capability. So I thought it was interesting how Toast kind of followed the, the value chain around like revenue where coming into the restaurant where a lot of people were like, all right, the focal point is point of sale. Let's go. And, and they went with the labor, right? They were like, Hey, let's fixate on costs. So it's like, all right, we have to onboard people that turn over like 30% will turn over in their first week or whatever. I mean, the data on hospitality is crazy. Yeah. Uh, so then we'll, we'll build mobile applicants. It's like, let's go after scheduling and point of sale and scheduling and then, okay, payroll. And then we'll do this other stuff. And toast is like, let's put, you know, embed the menus here. Let's, you know, get curbside delivery. Let's, you know, build loyalty programs. So they kind of followed the revenue side and it seems to have worked yep. pretty well. Um, okay. And those are all the ways that restaurants are trying to play. Everyone wants to focus on the creative side, cooking and providing good quality food, right. And a good experience. But beyond yeah. that, a lot of folks in the hospitality aren't necessarily thinking about the business side. So it's nice when you have a platform, not a point solution, a platform that can handle a lot of those business management needs so you can focus on what you love doing. Amen. Um, and then they go into some of the other details. So obviously customer conversations, it doesn't seem like customer concentration of revenue was an issue. And obviously venture probably wouldn't care so much about that, but um, so they you know, spoke to some customers and then here's kind of where they get into some of the elements where it's cloud-based, that was 
strangely interesting in 2015. Um, <laughs> the hardware also slow and clunky. <laughs> yeah, 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 totally. So anyway, so that gets the buzzwords. See you around. There you go, and then they go into market. And I mean, I think this is more or less. Um, and it's interesting because it it didn't really go into like the customer's customer in terms of cost structure of restaurants, right? And like, hey, what is a conventional SaaS stack or operational tech stack and where does Toast fit in? Because you want it to be high on the revenue generating component and low on the cost creating component, right? Like that's ideally where you want to be in terms of the cost structure in the context of whatever industry you're talking about. So this was basically like, there's a shitload of, of restaurants <laughs> and they're, you know, and they're not going to be in structural decline. Obviously no one has a crystal ball, but you know, this was before any kind of thought process around pandemics or any kind of weird shit like that. Um, I was, I was going to say, we could probably hypothesize thinking of like a pandemic or like various economic situations. It's hospitality is just too variable, probably to come up with a, like a conclusive average. You know what I mean? <laughs> yeah, totally. Well, I think it was interesting that they did some thought process around like, all right, so we have kind of mid-market chains and hospitality is such a beast. And I know it well from my days at Harry, but it's like, all right, we have kind of quick service, fast, casual, fine dining is, is a spectrum. And then, and that's kind of like uh, what, what like cost pr price point or kind of the sophistication of the customer or the circumstance of the customer socio-demographically. And then you have like the actual operating model, which is like single unit, multi-unit franchise, corporate owned. So you kind of blend all these things together and it's like this four dimensional matrix to figure out where you are in the market. But they're like, okay, mid market chains. Cool. There's approximately three to 400,000 that are mid market chains, which is like, you know, they've got 10 to 20 locations. Cool. We had a conversation with Chipotle, which is one of the, you know, heavy hitters period. They would do a beta that's, you know, you know, knocking down one national chain in the next 24 to 36 months is going to three X revenue. And then you got to think about downstream and implementing all that stuff and scaling up support, et cetera. But they, they touch on it. So again, they're getting folks jazzed about, Hey, what's the upside here. And then they get into, and that revel, there you go. There you go. Uh, breadcrumb. Yep. And they were acquired by Groupon, which I remember that that was so weird that Groupon acquired them. Um, th yeah. That was kind of, reverse integration, right? It's like, hey, let's just get closer to the customer, et cetera. But it's short and sweet. It's like, hey, and it's almost like, what's one thing that to note? Um, and then they go in here and this is where they talk a lot about bootstrap growth. They talk a lot about, probably at this point, it was account executives selling into geographic territories versus segment-based. So they're like, all right, now we want to think about SMB. This is going to be like, you know, canvassing geographies or whatever, or working through multi-unit. We want to hire up a couple of enterprise folks. You're going to go knock down Burger King, McDonald's and whatever, who has huge homegrown proprietary stuff. And there's a lot of uh, like status quo there and inertia to fight, but let's get after it. And then they get into financials, pretty straightforward. It was interesting, you know, God bless just how simple this PL is, man. It's like, that, no, no new bookings, and then they just, they're just looking at top line, man. There's just not even a thought process around what costs look like or cost structure. They do lean into CAC here. Yeah, yeah, there you go. Um, but it's just CAC, right? So they're not unwinding, like, what does OPEX look like? ARR per employee. Um, it's probably because one, it was bootstrapped. Two, the sales was ran by the co-founder. Like, they yeah. just kept shit really simple, especially coming up against giants. Most companies think we have to get a large investment to come up against giants because, like you say, they sneeze and it's over for you. But these guys just did it right. Like, they stayed analytical, and that that's really the approach that set them apart. Totally. Totally. Um, and cool. So then we get into – and they, I think they split the round – with Google Ventures, uh, no, Google Ventures came in Eventually. with with five million. Um, That's cool. The bootstrap a company didn't have Google Ventures come in a couple of years later and just say here. <laughs> yeah, totally. So they've got wipeout is kind of the worst case scenario, and that exit multiple would be zero. So they're just going to basically, you know, I don't even know what you do. I, I mean, in our scenario, we think about you know chopping it up and selling for parts, like whatever you can. Like if you know re retention falls out the window. Um, yeah. And you basically can't service debt, you know, that's the wipeout scenario. It's like, okay. And then you try to figure out what you can do. Um, aqua, aqua hire product IP sale makes a ton of sense. Growth plateaus, PE backed roll up. 
right? So it's like, hey, we've got Toast, we've got Revel. They're all kind of in this place. There isn't so much a breakout. Great. Let's go. Let's do a, a roll up strategy here. We're going to go acquire. Yeah, dividends. Yep. And then um, and smush them together. And all of a sudden, we've got Revel and and Toast and another one. Ooh, wow. Now we've got a $70 million ARR heavy hitter that's got you know decent market share in the, in the Northeast mm. or whatever. Let's go, go, go. Um, low end strategic or PE sale at 25 million ARR. So again, playing the private equity game here, mid case to legacy player, high case to legacy player. So now we're talking about s- selling to strategics here where, you know, there's going to be a premium. You would think there'd be a little bit more of a premium on the exit multiple in these scenarios. Um, successful IPO, which I think did toast IPO. Sure. They did. Yeah. Toast oh, IPO. Shoot. Okay. So they, they hit it. They hit it. I wonder what they traded at. Out of the gate. So, so they were valued at 20 billion. Okay. God. So they hit like the total spank it out of the stratosphere. <laughs> uh, and so I think they probably IPO'd at north of a hundred million error. It was which, forty dollars. Oh man, forty dollars a share, dude. Yeah, it, I think it was north of a hundred million. <laughs> cool. So they basically achieved the t- top, hit it out of the park. Next, Micros or NCR, which is probably a little bit debatable. Like I'll bet Micros has weird market share with like Red Robin and or you know I don't know like just weird uh, like two or three accounts that keep it just at some revenue mul- or revenue generation kind of threshold that you know, keeps it interesting and relevant. Um, mm-hmm. Anywho, then they go, okay, so cool. So there's like some scenario based thoughts here. They assign a, uh, there's an implied enterprise value, which is diluted. Um, they have an exit multiple and it sounds like these are very, so let's move left to right. Exit multiple, very standard, some kind of dilution um, enterprise value here. They assign a probability, right? Which is, looks kind of normally distributed. Like they're thinking that, the base case is a low end strategic or PE sale, 25 million. And then everything else is, is kind of out to the right. Uh, time to exit. This is a timeline, which is interesting because um, you know, typically you want to, I don't know, this is a little bit punitive, right? The more time, but obviously there's two sides to that coin, right? The longer you hold the asset, the greater the growth. And that could be interesting, but obviously that weighs down. And I'm not a huge fan of IRR, but um, a lot of folks are. So anyway, and then uh, return contribution, I'll bet this is to the fund. Or I wonder, oh no, that wouldn't make sense. I'm not sure how they're thinking about return contribution here, but um, anywho, and then they do some kind of average scenario. So it's like, we're looking at, you know, kind of a base case of 3.1, a 2.6 multiple, a 30% IRR. Uh, and then there's a sharp ratio in here in an SD. So anyway, that's cool. That's thoughtful. That's more baked than what we disclose. Uh, we're usually like, shit hits the fan. Things go okay. Things go as planned. We rip. Um, and those are kind of the spectrum of outcomes for us. Key risks. Let's see. Competition is noisy and toast fails to emerge. Okay, cool. And this is kind of key risk, I think, to the grand slam outcome. Um, and then they grow to death. Okay. And then I think this is something around maybe debt markets down the line. I don't know. That's kind of interesting. So, and here we go. For the past 18 months, we stood by anxiously as the team hit an obvious product market fit, but punted on raising more equity. And so it seems, and I wonder what this was an A round. Sorry, let's go to the top. Oh, it doesn't say, oh, it's okay. Series B. Okay, cool, cool. So this is a series B. So up until this point, um, I think they, they mentioned some convertible debt, but it seems like this was the first institutional round. So Bessemer, not regretting this one. <laughs> and, and I think what's cool too is they have like their anti-portfolio in here somewhere, um, which I think be philosophy. Yeah, like the anti-portfolio, honoring the companies we missed. So there's there's some club bangers here, but um, you know, so this is cool. Yeah, dude, I was going to say, so I did some research on the, um, for the IPO goal of 100 million. Dude, they were between 300 and 400 million right before they IPO'd. And right cool. after they IPO'd, it soared to 500. Now they're at like 800. <laughs> so they're, I wonder, uh, I wonder what NCR. NCR. Yeah, like at this point, we have to see what the market share is on NCR and Micros because <laughs> Toast is eating. No pun yeah, intended. That- Okay, so NCR did 7.16 billion in revenue. 
They have 36,000. I mean, NCR is like been around. And it stands yeah. for National Cash Register. Oh, I didn't know that. I didn't know that either. Um, let's see. Michael's, yeah, Michael's did 1 billion. All right. So I think NCR is ahead of the pack. And I, and I mean, obviously, okay. So NCR annual revenue for 21 was 7.2 billion. They grew at 15.3% from 2020. So NCR is still punching, man. Um, oh, wait, hold on. How much? How much did you say it was last year? Revenues? Yeah. Uh, 7.2 billion. Huh. They, which is a oh, 15 okay. and change percent growth from 2020. Okay. Yeah, not a problem. I was looking at Oracle, which <laughs> they created the micro systems. And I was like, whoa, Michael's is at 50 oh. billion. But no, that's Oracle. Micros that's Oracle, is at right? Billion. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. I, yeah I, and I knew, I knew, I knew that. I knew that Oracle got, I think they got them up. Toast, Toast outranked Micros. Toast hit for 2.5 billion 2022. So wow. Toast is now number two. God, and I knew so many of the of that crew. Oh gosh, that's cool. I, I that's yeah, I was cool, excited to look. I, so when I saw it, I was like, ooh, I want to read that one because that was such. And I think the thing that stood out to me was that they, their hard pivot to embedded fintech, and they're like, we're going to go up POS, and then we're going to stand up merchant accounts, and then because at that point that was totally fragmented, right? All the restaurants were working with like their banks for merchant yeah. services, so they rolled that up, and then all of a sudden they have visibility into transactions and credit worthiness. Now they're like, hey, how about a toast, you know, credit card? And around and around you go. Then they just start harvesting data and they get predictive with stuff. And that's a real platform that they they can start to build on. So yeah, that's dope. Well, Kay Lou, thank you for the time, my friend. Pleasure as yeah. always. Of course. Maybe next time we can get into mind and body. I thought this story was phenomenal. But um, but dude, this this conversation today with Toast, um, it took me a lot back to my namely days. Just me too. My hairy <laughs> days. I was like, oh boy. HCM, baby. Here we go. Hospitality. Yep, yep. Let's go. Yep. And if you're ever in New York, um, I mean, feel free to stop by. Uh, like I told you before, we're working on uh, getting this guy his own restaurant. So maybe you can see the whole Rebel system in, in play. And it's it's phenomenal, man. Seeing that whole platform in play, like it manages everything we need. So talking about Toast and then doing that, like in the evenings with him, it's nice just seeing it one to one. I love it, dude. That's awesome. All right. Yeah. Same time, same channel next Thursday. Yes, sir. Got it. Giddy God up. bless us. Check you later. Peace. Check you later.